Sophia's seventh letter. Dear Yaristan, you'll never guess where I am. Outside there's a general strike. Everything is out of commission. Literally everything. Factories, offices, transportation vehicles, even taxis. Everything except the telephones and a radio station that's been taken over by the police. I ought to be in the council office or in the research center where Tissy and Sabina are conquering the whole universe or somewhere in the midst of all the excitement. But I'm sitting at my desk in Luisa's house writing you on the ancient typewriter I inherited from George Alberts when he left. I'm surprised it still works. It's the machine on which I was going to type up my novel about you and Ron Matthews as soon as I organized all my notes. Luisa cleaned the room so thoroughly after Art moved out that there was no trace of anyone's having been there since I left for college 15 years ago. The walls are the same walls I stared at day after day 20 years ago, wondering why I had been separated from my Yaristan and from the only friends I had in the world. The bed is the same bed I shared with Ron for a whole week after the night when his father threatened to shoot both of us, that happy week which ended with my thinking Sabina had stolen Ron from me. It was the only happy week I spent in this room. Before and after that week, I only dreamed of happiness. I spun that whole universe of illusions which you finally succeeded in shattering completely. I didn't pretend Sophia was anyone I had ever loved. I only used her. I've been staring at those two sentences the way I once stared at the walls of this room. In one of my letters, I tried to argue that the reality on which I based my dreams didn't matter because my dreams only defined what I sought, not what I had actually lived. Now I know I was wrong, dead wrong. The reality does matter to me. I got both your letters this morning. I read them in the order in which you sent them and could barely read through the first. I felt empty and hideous inside. I had based my whole life, my daily acts, as well as my most distant hopes, on a travesty. You had only used me. That matters to me. It matters to every nerve in my brain and to every organ in my body. In your later letter, which I've just read, you tell me that our correspondence has been important to all of you. You tell me that Myrna, Yara, as well as Yasna have been stimulated by some of the things I've written and even that their very decisions and actions have in some way been affected by me. What if none of what I'd written were true? What if I'd never left this room and had invented everything I've narrated? Wouldn't that matter to you, to all of you? I was in a rage when I read your confession, and I spent the entire day squeezing my illusion out of my being, acting without Yaristan at the center of my consciousness. Thanks to my rage, an hour ago I achieved something I might call my independence. For once in my life I didn't try to live up to my central experience. I acted on my own and for myself. I abandoned myself to my wildest desires and I didn't try to live up to anything except my own passion. If Myrna had been here, she would have loved me. Sabina would have too. And contrary to what Myrna suggested about Louisa and me, I'm not running from the consequences. I'm staying right here, eager to face every one of the consequences. Louisa's hostility, Damon's hatred, Pat Klesek's suspicion and even fear, as well as my own newborn inexperience and untried independence. What enraged me even more than your confession was the fact that I recognized myself in your description. That passive, fragile, mindless thing who is perfectly willing to do whatever pleases you, Yaristan, is the same person who recently begged 18-year-old Pat Klesek to show me what to do. That identical posture at the beginning and end of two decades of experience was not a reflection of my weakness, of a moment of dependence in an otherwise independent person. That posture indicated the depth and extent of my independence. I made each of those statements during a period when I had broken out of passivity and joined a community of independent individuals. You're forcing me to recognize the lies I've told myself for the past 20 years enraged me infinitely more than your admission of your desire to shatter a porcelain statue into splinters. All my life I've been surrounded by people I considered independent, people who were in some way rebels. I hardly know what normal, submissive people are like, yet I'm one of them. The rebel Natula was my life's hero, but I never rebelled against him. Louisa, the insurgent unionist, was my life's first model, but I never turned against her. I left her. The day Tina told Sabina and me that we cramped her, I was hurt. Yet Tina did what I've never done. She rebelled against her parents and took the indispensable step towards independence. I took an easier route. A child of radical parents, I was in the privileged position of being a rebel by birth. All I had to do was conform to my parents. My life's idols and my parents never clashed. They were the same. Sabina didn't ever reject her mother either, but Sabina rediscovered the source of Margarita's rebellion and made it her own. She reacted to the world Margarita had reacted to, and her response was her own authentic response to that world. I never tried to rediscover the source. 
I only tried to copy my model's responses. I tried to make my behavior conform to Luisa's and the mythical Nachalos. What was radical to the world at large was the norm to me. That's why you and Yasna saw such a normal, prim, correct young lady come to the carton plant with Luisa. I had anticipated the coming of the revolution the way a normal girl must anticipate the coming of marriage. When the revolution finally came and my mother accompanied me to it, I gave myself to it as dutifully as to the unavoidable, expected husband, whatever pleases you, Yaristan. It wasn't a forced marriage. I'm not suggesting that. I had seen you at our house. I had listened to you. I hadn't known it would be with you I'd leave for the barricades, although I had wished it. When it was you, nothing could have been more natural. I stepped into a ready-made revolution the way the new bride steps into her assigned husband's ready-made home. She steps into an alien house, another's house, eager to learn her tasks. Show me what to do. Don't take all the credit for having used me, Yaristan. Some of the credit is mine. I gave myself to you as something to be used, as clay to be shaped. Couldn't I tell you you didn't love me? Oh no, Yaristan, not I, and not then. It wasn't love that had brought me to you, but destiny. I was Nachalo's daughter. I had been brought up for the revolution, and I had come of age. I was simply being transferred from Luisa's care to yours. You were to me what Nachalo had always been to me, my model, my idol. It never occurred to me to ask myself whether or not you loved me. It was my duty to love you. Luisa just came back. It's long past midnight. I shouted down to ask if she wanted to talk, but she apparently doesn't. When I asked if she'd mind if I went on typing, she slammed the door of her bedroom. She's in a fury now. Today it was my turn to shatter a porcelain statue, maybe even several. You probably thought your confession would shock me. It didn't. Your description wasn't exaggerated. I happen to remember the morning when I lay naked on the floor with you right by the carton plant entrance. The reason I remember is that only a year later, by the shore of a pond to which Ron and I had ridden our bikes, I lay awake all night long worrying. I was afraid the farmer would open a gate and let the sun shine in on us the way Luisa did. I was afraid because I was ashamed to be seen as a body, as a naked animal. Ashamed because I thought myself the very negation of a body. I was all principle, revolutionary determination, goal. If your desire wasn't roused by any passion in me except my shame, it's because that shame was the only passion in me. You don't exaggerate in the least when you say I turned exactly as I thought I should. The desire to turn differently simply wasn't in me. I didn't only turn without passion. I also experienced your embraces without passion, exactly as I expected to experience them. Nothing surprised me. Nothing excited me physically. I said I love you, you understand. I've said it since. I can say it as easily now, after your confession, as I ever could before. I love you, Yaristan. That's not a description of my passion. It's something like my life's principle, my motto. It's almost my name. When you had your orgasm that morning between my legs, I was very excited, but not physically, only intellectually. I was proud of myself, proud to be fulfilling the task I'd been brought up for. I would have been equally proud if you'd praised me for coining a perfectly appropriate slogan or for printing a beautiful poster. During all the days and nights we spent together, you didn't rouse me sexually once, even for an instant. You weren't a body to me, but a principle. My feelings towards you were exact inversions of your feelings towards Louisa. You embraced the revolutionary principle with a sexual passion as a body. I embraced your body intellectually as a principle. I'm not saying any of this out of spite. I'm ashamed of myself. Your letter forced me to come to terms with a self I can't stand. Isn't it beyond belief that someone could grow up between Luisa and Sabina Nachalo and remain sexless? I'm ashamed to admit to Yara and to Myrna that I understood perfectly how poor Vesna must have felt in the face of their unbounded animal passion. Shivers went down my back when I learned Myrna had apparently desired her own father physically, sexually, as a body. The same shivers I experienced ten years ago when I learned that my closest friend and comrade desired her own sex physically. The same shivers Vesna must have experienced when the prospect of physical contact with you was thrown in her face. Until today, except for one single period which I tried to erase from my memory, I've lived at the opposite end of the world. Today I made my grand entrance into Marina's world. I thank your letter for that. I know I'm scabbing against the postal worker's strike by having you send your letters across the frontier, but I agree with Myrna and Yasna that it would be awful to stop communicating with you precisely at this moment when everything is possible. Your letters are my only connection with my likes elsewhere, and they're every bit as precious to me with all your confessions as mine could possibly be to any of you. This has been an incredible week. Almost everyone is on strike. All major workshops, assembly plants, and factories are occupied by workers. For two days, Pat and I visited an immense research center which has been transformed into something like a technological playground. 
Sabina and Tissy gave us fascinating tours. I would have loved to stay, but Pat thought we might be more useful in the council office. He was wrong. Nothing much was happening in the council office last night or this morning, but I'm glad we returned, since otherwise I wouldn't have gotten your letters. Early this morning, I decided to call Louisa. I learned a week ago that her assembly plan is on strike, but I didn't learn any of the details. I was curious about her response to the strike. The last time I called her, I got furious at her for telling me she was waiting for the union to call the strike. She's still asleep when I call. Won't you be late for work? I asked sarcastically. This happens to be one of the few weekdays in my life when I haven't set my alarm, Sophia. Couldn't you have called an hour later? I don't know where I'll be in an hour, and I'm dying to talk to you. David and I did intend to try to get together with you. Why don't you both come to the council office, I suggest. People here would love to hear about your strike. Louisa hesitates for a moment and then asks, Would they? The union called the strike. I've been on the picket line every afternoon. It's my turn to hesitate. I didn't know the union had called any of the strikes. I feel irritated, even angry, at this reminder of the character of Louisa's insurgency. It's not Louisa who rebels, it's her apparatus that trains Denick describes so straightforwardly. Even that rotten union in her plan is still a union, and a strike not called by a union would be meaningless to her. I hold my anger in. I don't want yet another conversation with Louisa to end up with her telling me, call me when you're less hysterical. After my shocked pause, I change the topic. How's your romance going? Not so hot. Damon is even more of a Puritan than you are, but he does join me at the picket line. Suddenly inspired by a plan, I ask her, would you mind if I joined you? Seriously, Sophia? A union picket line? Giving all my plans away at once, I ask her, would you mind if I brought some of my friends? Obviously not, Louisa exclaims. Bring your friends and raise all the hell you want with the union bureaucrats. The first day was exciting because some workers tried to go inside to work, but since then it's been a horrible bore. Do you want us to pick you up? I tell her the room where she and Damon can find us. I beg her to have Damon drive across the border to my foreign post box and also to stop by my house to see if any letters came from you. I find Pat in the makeshift cafeteria and join him for a quick breakfast. I tell him, in fact I sort of warn him, that I invited a union organizer as well as a professor to the council office. I don't check people's credentials, you know, he says with some annoyance. I know, but they're both good friends of mine, I explain awkwardly. I don't want him to chase them away with intimidating arguments the moment they walk in. Louisa is the woman I told you about, the one who took part in that revolution 32 years ago. Well, that's the type of union organizer I would like to meet. I don't think you find her very different from her colleagues. How would you like to raise hell at a union-run picket line, I ask him. Several people are already in the council office when Pat and I get there. The discussion is fascinating, but I'll just summarize it. People are talking about the strikes that have been breaking out in other cities, and mainly about the fact that one corporation's productive facilities all over the country are occupied by workers. Everyone's enthusiasm is dampened by a person who points out that this corporation's foreign plants have been running at full capacity. Even if the movement here is victorious, such corporations will shift their operations abroad and continue to determine the content of human activity from there. People then discuss the prospects for the destruction of international corporations on a worldwide scale. Questions of language barriers, of forms of communication, of traveling delegations are raised and dropped. About two hours after my call to Louisa, there's a knock on the door of the council office. Everyone in the room glares with amazement, and a few people laugh. Damon and Louisa back away from the laughter. They probably think I told people two agents of the system were coming, which is in fact what I told Pat. I run out and shout, Good grief, Damon, how many classes have you taught in this very room? This isn't a private apartment, you know. Poor Louisa. She looks terribly intimidated. She's never been in the university before, although she's always revered it. It's awful what institutions do to people. To you, to me, to all her friends, Louisa is the intellectual, a virtual encyclopedia on unionism and revolution. Yet the minute she walks into the official intelligence building, she sees herself through an official eyes as a working woman who never finished high school, therefore unschooled, namely ignorant. I know exactly how she feels. I felt the same way the day Tina took me by the hand and accompanied me to the commune. I wasn't intimidated by the university, but by the revolution I imagined to be boiling inside it. Louisa is wearing the same pretty dress she wore the day we visited Lem's estate. She had expected Damon to call her on that day, but I had called instead. I take her hand and pull her into the council office. They all bite here, but none of them has rabies, I tell her, introducing her to Pat. Damon remains outside. When I extend my hand to him, he gives me both your letters. He's not exactly friendly towards me, and I can't say I don't know why. The last time I saw him, Sabina had insisted he had a phonograph inside his head. 
He tried so desperately to defend himself from Sabina's attack, and all I'd done to help him was to suggest he call the police to protect him from her. My respect for Damon has been the main casualty of my correspondence with you. Trying to break the silence, I asked him with unintended sarcasm, Have you been on vacation since you lost your job? Damon is offended. It so happens I've been working much harder this past two weeks than I work when school is on. Really? Is that why you haven't had time to come here, even for a visit? So much has been happening here. What have you been doing? We finally got that organization off the ground, Damon says proudly. The people I've met here have been getting along perfectly without that kind of organ. Damon interrupts me. The professor replaces the intimidated tourist as he asserts authoritatively, the new society will not be created here, but at the point of production, particularly in the basic industries. It isn't born in the heads of intellectuals. Is that what your organization is organizing? The new society, I ask him, this time with intended sarcasm. Damon answers with a grave tone. We've already gotten that one issue of our paper. Unable to curb my sarcasm, I exclaim, not that newspaper for workers edited by a professor and his political students. Damon's tone becomes condescending. It so happens that production workers actually wrote the entire issue. It's not a paper for workers, but a worker's paper. There's a world of difference. Its task is not to speak for the workers, but to let the workers speak for themselves. All the workers? It must be an immense newspaper. Damon's face becomes crimson, and I realize I'm doing exactly what I'd hoped Pat wouldn't do, intimidating him to the point of driving him away. I reword my question. Did many workers contribute articles? You have to understand there are certain financial difficulties, as well as the problem of time. This issue has two articles, both written by production workers. Louisa happens to have written one of them. I'm now in contact with a third. Louisa wrote an article? I'd like to see your paper. Damon beams. I just happen to have several copies with me. Really? Well, let's take them inside. Everyone in there will want to see them. Damon pulls out his handful of workers' newspapers as we walk into the room, and I immediately feel sorry for him. His organization's achievement looks pathetic in a room filled with beautifully printed leaflets and pamphlets. It's called The Worker's Voice, and it's a dirty mimeograph sheet with crooked headlines and barely readable typewritten text. Both articles are unsigned. One is titled, The Workers Can Do It, and deals with workers who ran a transportation system without any bosses other than union bosses. The other looks, at a glance, like an article on the beneficial effects of higher wages. Do you actually give these out to workers occupying their factories, I ask him? They're going like hotcakes, Damon tells me. He smiles as he starts giving copies to the people in the room. We've been handing them out at Luisa's plant, and we're getting rid of at least 50 a day. We only ran off 500. When Damon hands a copy to Pat, Luisa exclaims, That's our workers' paper! Pat glances at both sides briefly, studies the side on wages, and lets out a guffaw. You call this a worker's paper? Damon's smile leaves his face, and his whole body gets rigid as he announces, What you understand by workers may be very different from what I understand. With a sweep of his arm, he dismisses the room full of people, as well as the stacks of strike announcements and factory occupation accounts. Students parading as a new working class just don't cut the ice. The new working class is an invention of petty bourgeois sociologists. I interrupt him angrily. Pat and I and you happen to be the only people in this room who don't come out of factories. A young worker shouts to Damon, What the hell is this new working class? Louisa tries to interpret Damon's outburst to the people in the room. He's referring to workers' relation to the traditional workers' movement, i.e. the union, Pat adds. But Damon persists. I'm talking about one's relation to the means of production, which is the only test of class. People whose function is to manipulate others are best defined as middle class. All the people in the room except Louisa and Pat move away from Damon. I move to the corner furthest from Damon and start looking at your first letter, but I continue listening with a certain amount of interest. Pat says calmly, Your categories are being superseded by present practice, pro mister. Pat remembers my warning, but only to the extent of not calling Damon a professor. Pat points to the Workers' Boys article on wages. What you call a worker's paper is nothing but an instrument of the union bureaucracy. It's an appendage to capital. Damon, unruffled by Pat's argument, or perhaps missing its point, repeats his ancient argument that the most thoroughly unionized and best-paid workers in the basic and heavy industries are central to any revolutionary upsurge. Pat retorts, Only when they stop production, only when they stop being unionized and best-paid, only when they stop being workers, when they cease to be slaves, when they become masters. But Damon insists, it's only the fact that they're workers, the fact that they're at the point of production that gives them their revolutionary capacity. 
It's their work that teaches them to run production. Their work re reproduces capital, and that's all, Pat shouts. You're an apologist for capital. In other words, a shithead. Several people applaud. And you obviously don't know what capital is, Damon says with a professorial contempt that infuriates me. By concentrating workers in the basic industries, capitalism itself creates the organization and discipline of the new society. This is greeted by catcalls, whistles, and various shouts like, here comes the boss, and the new society looks just like the old. Someone asks, you a factory owner, mister? I can't resist answering, no, he's a professor. Various people exclaim, oh. Damon, leering with hostility at everyone in the room, expresses his understanding of the situation. It's obvious that I've walked into a meeting of a political sect that adheres to the theory of the backwardness of the working class. Those unionized and well-paid workers you sneer at. I can't stand that condescending, self-effacing posture. I interrupt him. We were sneering at you. He ignores me. Those unionized workers you consider so backward are the ones who continually develop the capacity to create the new society. Their work is inherently revolutionary. In other words, work hard and obey the rules, Pat shouts. Kiss the boss's ass, follow the leader, that's the revolution. Leaders don't simply impose themselves on the class, they're products of the class. Workers produce their strongest leaders when they're themselves strongest. And on and on. I've heard it all before. Damon really does have a photograph in his head instead of a brain. Pat and occasionally some of the other people try in vain to communicate with him. Periodically, Louisa tries to translate his most unpalatable observations. I finally lose interest in the argument and start reading the letter Damon picked up at my house. It must have arrived a few days after Sabina and I left with Tina, just before the postal strike began. Damon, Louisa, the argument in the council office vanish as I lose myself in the world you describe. Earlier, I came close to suggesting that your confession was the only part of your letter I responded to. That isn't the case at all. I'm amazed to discover the Yasna who speaks through your letter, praising Sabina for having the courage to realize her desires, desires which Yasna never allowed herself to realize. I'm even more amazed by Myrna. Your earlier letter had given me a significantly different picture. I'm surprised to discover a Myrna who is a lot in common with Sabina, and even more surprised to learn they knew each other. Myrna is perfectly right about my failure to face any of the consequences caused by the letter I sent you 12 years ago. I didn't even know there had been any consequences until I had learned about them from your letters and from Lem. Of course I realize it was the police, and not my letter, that did the jailing and the killing, but I still feel awful. Obviously nothing I can say now can bring back Myrna's father, or Jan, or Vesna. I'm surprised you didn't learn about that letter for such a long time after your arrest. I'm also puzzled by something in your second letter. Neither you, nor Yasna, nor apparently anyone else had known that Louisa, Sabina, and I were, were released after our arrest at the carton plant. Yet I vaguely remember that Titus Sabran was with us when we were released, so at least he must have known about it. I also vaguely remember Louisa telling me years ago that Titus didn't emigrate with us because he wanted to stay behind to try to have the rest of you released. Your confession isn't the only part I respond to, but I admit it's the part I continue responding to for the rest of the day. As I read about your love for Louisa, the council office comes back into focus, and so does Louisa, nearly a quarter of a century older than the woman in your letter, but just as vigorous, just as youthful, and just as seductive. Her seductiveness is novel to me. Either I'm very dense, or else she kept it from me. The truth lies somewhere in between. You're right, I didn't know you had slept with Louisa at our house. While I inform myself of that fact, I notice that Damon is no longer arguing with Pat. He's in a corner of the room, chatting with a woman. She probably expressed interest in his organization. Pat and most of the workers hover around Louisa. Apparently, they all know her to be the co-author of the worker's voice. Someone points out that the articles on the wages flatly contradicts her article, but no argument follows. Louisa is an organizer, a politician, a charmer, as well as a diplomat. She agrees that the point is not to have higher wages for slave labor, but to appropriate the productive forces and be free. Yet in the same breath, she manages to defend Damon as well as the writer of the other article. The main point is to act, and even someone fighting for higher wages is more of a revolutionary than people who merely sit in a room and talk. Pat starts to ask, Are you going to tell us that workers producing weapons for the police are doing more than... Obviously not, Louisa exclaimed, looking uneasily towards Damon, but I am saying that workers on a picket line may themselves organize, defending their jobs from scabs, are doing infinitely more than what I see being done here. What if some of us went to your picket line to find out if it really is organized by the workers themselves, Pat asks. The more the merrier, Louisa exclaims. 
How many want to check out and, if need be, challenge the organization of that picket line? She's in her milieu. Someone asks, will the union goons actually let us talk to any workers? All you have to do is outshout the loudspeaker, she answers. Pat makes another suggestion. What if we go with a leaflet explaining who we are? It could start with the question, why do you let the loudspeakers speak for you? Shouting, that's magnificent. It's what I've always asked myself. Louisa throws her arms around Pat, and I almost fall off my chair, almost scattering your letter all over the room. I, Sophia Natulo, queen of the peasants, prim, correct, and well-mannered, perfect for shattering, afraid to hold Pat's hand because he's only 18, start to boil, and I go on boiling until I make myself the one who carries the revolution to the peasants, until I'm the one who shatters porcelain statues. The leaflet on loudspeakers is composed in less than 15 minutes. It consists of a sequence of slogans. Almost everyone, including Louisa, contributes one. When it's done, Louisa suggests that it's going to be printed on the mimeograph in the basement of Damon's house. But Pat objects, we have access to printing equipment only a few minutes away from here, and I know how to print. Someone else with the name of Natchelo taught me. Louisa looks quizzically at me. I didn't know you could print. It's Tina, I tell her. Damon expresses sudden interest. Tina is here? And she prints? He doesn't seem at all eager to have another run-in with her. Everyone except the two people who volunteered to spend the day in the council office sets out towards Ted's cooperative print shop. Pat and Louisa, her arm locked in his, lead the procession of 14 or so people. Damon and his new friend continue their conversation several feet behind everyone else. I learn that his newest recruit is a worker from the office machine plant Pat and I visited during my first week here. I walk right behind Pat and Louisa with both your letters in my handbag. On the way to the print shop, Louisa tells Pat, I agree with you about the other article in the worker's voice. Its author is a union man, and I objected to Damon's including it. The union I fought with was a genuine workers' union, which had nothing in common with this company union. It had no paid functionaries. Pat objects. Yet after the victory, some of the unpaid functionaries became government ministers and factory managers. I'm continually amazed by how re well read he is. You have to understand the circumstances, Louisa pleads. It was war, and war always destroys everything people fight for. Pat doesn't pursue his argument. Ever since we went to talk to the office machine workers, I've been aware that Pat isn't nearly as argumentative with women as he is with men. Only Pat, Louisa, and I go to, into the print shop. The others wait outside. Pat immediately sits down at an electric typewriter. As soon as Tina sees Louisa, she exclaims, Well, I'll be damned. How many years is it since you've taken a day off work? I take it that you naturalos know each other, Pat ascertains. May I ask if you're related? Tina, mounting an enormous plate onto the metal cylinder of a press, shouts, Can't you see the family resemblance? Sophia and Louisa are sisters. I'm their mother. What else do you want to know? Pat mutters, That'll teach me to snoop. He proofreads the leaflet before mounting it in the camera copy board. Then he takes Louisa's hand and pulls her toward the darkroom entrance. Come on, I'll show you how production can take place without managers or union bureaucrats. I'm on the verge of asking, Can I come too? I've never seen that type of photography. And the thought of Louisa whisking you off to the stockroom of the carton plant flashes through my mind. But I walk toward the large press Tina is adjusting. Back so soon, Tina asks me, concentrating on the press. From the research center, I ask. Tina turns the press on. I couldn't get my fill of it, she shouts above the noise of the press. I could have spent my whole life playing with all those tools and gadgets. I back away from Tina as she pulls a printed sheet from the press and I almost trip over a box. I feel intimidated by her comments. I stayed at the research center for two days, but it didn't ever occur to me that I might want to play with the tools and gadgets. The only time I experienced such a desire was in the garage, when I was Tina's apprentice. It's not a coincidence that in the garage I also performed my life's single independent act. The night I threw myself on Jose because I had decided to demonstrate the exact nature of my innermost desires. But my independence began and ended with that act. That night I acted in the spirit of Tina, in the spirit of what the garage stood for. I was my own person. I made myself what I most wanted to be. What I made myself independently on my own, what I most wanted to be, was dependent. I wanted to be your shadow, Ron's shadow, Jose's shadow, even Tina's shadow. By that independent act, I annihilated my independence. The garage was my one community where my role wasn't predefined, where I had to define the nature of my life and the content of my activity on my own. Unlike seven-year-old Tina, I was only able to define myself the same way I had always defined myself, as part of someone else's project, as Tina's apprentice and Jose's woman. I'd give you a tour, Tina shouts, but these pamphlets have to be done by noon. How did you learn to use all these things so fast, I asked her. 
I didn't learn fast, she shouts. Now that you know Ted isn't the beast you thought him, I might as well tell you I've been here since the print shop started over two years ago. You've been seeing Ted for the past two years? Did Sabina know? You're the only one who didn't know, she shouts. My head starts to spin. Didn't I know about your affair with Louisa under my very nose in my own house? I was the only one who didn't know. I've been seeing Ted ever since Sabina and I left the garage. Don't look so glum. You made it perfectly obvious you didn't want to hear a word about him. Tina turns the press off and starts to dismount the plate. I turn to another topic. Have you known Pat long? He sure is a bird, isn't he? I've never known anyone quite like him, she says, laughing and sitting down on a box. I met him a few days before I moved out of our house. I was here when Pat and his whole group of friends came in. They said they'd heard Ted and I often help students with their printing projects, and then they said they were anti-students. They didn't want either to contract a job or hire a proletarian. They had come to create a new situation. Ted didn't know what to make of them. They talked about numerous projects, such as leaflets, pamphlets, even books. They showed me some of the things they'd written, attacks on every imaginable authority, especially revolutionary ones. I loved it. They told me none of them could draw, but when I volunteered to do some of the drawing for them, Pat got mad. That's not the point, he said. We want to break down all those divisions. We all want to draw, write, print. I begged Tina not to spoil her schedule because of me. The press is running perfectly, so I'm way ahead of my deadline. Anyway, Pat asked me if Ted would be willing to take part in their projects as an equal. I asked if Ted would have to enroll in college to be their equal, and Pat scolded me, saying he hadn't come to be ridiculed, but to establish a direct, transparent, non-capitalist relationship. I understood what he meant, and it appealed to me a lot. I told him I'd take part. You? Pat asked with disbelief. Now who's doing the ridiculing? I asked him. He tried to get out of it by asking if I was the printer's daughter. They invited me to their next meeting and I went. I'm one of them now. But since that day, I haven't let Pat forget that he didn't want to be the equal of an 18-year-old girl who'd never been to school. Except for that I think he's nice. They all are. I'm the only woman in the group. And after that day, they've all gone out of their way to treat me as an equal. Ted walks towards us from the back of the shop. He lives upstairs. Tina shouts to him, Would you mind giving Sophia a tour? I'd like to finish running this pamphlet. I just saw Ted the previous evening, but I rushed toward him as if he were an old friend. The previous day, he had driven Pat and me back from the research center. I shake his hand eagerly. I'm really impressed by the size of this place. It's immense, even when I think of the place we were in yesterday. After all, this is the work of a single individual. Two, not one, he insists. Tina did more than half the work. Accompanying me from the press back towards the dark room, he adds, she's the one who built the dark room and she got the large press running. Really? I exclaim. Where in the world should she learn to do that? You didn't know? Tina had jobs in every major print shop in the city. She didn't only learn to run the machines, she also walked off with a bag full of supplies every time she left her job. It suddenly occurs to me that the few times I had asked her what kind of job she had, she told me she was printing. I had merely asked because, to me, all jobs were wage labor and therefore the same. Tina actually stole the supplies you use here? Everything except the machinery and the paper, until a couple of weeks ago. What happened then, I ask? He leads me to a corner of the shop and proudly points to several stacks of paper, mounds of unsorted inks, film boxes, and various objects I can't identify. Everything started to change. A group of kids came in to learn to print. Then other groups came. Lots of them. Factory workers, some actual printers. They started teaching each other. The presses started running day and night. Leaflets, posters, picture books, beautiful things, too. And they all brought things from places on strike. Inks, paper, plates... Two groups even set up silk screening in the back. Some of them can print as well as Tina. I thought I might be needed here, but I'm not. I'll be going back to Sabina and Tissy tomorrow. They'd both be happy if I took you along. I tell Ted I'll try to come, but it looks like I won't make it. Tomorrow's right now, and I'd rather finish this letter before accumulating yet more experiences to describe to you. Pat and Louisa are no longer in the dark room. Pat is running the leaflet off on a small press, and Louisa is outside, proudly showing a copy to Damon. I run out to have a look. Damon holds the copy in his hand and frowns. Isn't it beautiful, Louise asked Damon, and it all took less than a half an hour for 2,000 copies. Ours took all of two weeks. Are we ready to go, Damon asks. Well, wait for Pat to bring the rest of the leaflets, won't you? Oh, don't be such a sourpuss, Damon. It makes the same point ours does. Why let the loudspeaker speak for you? Well, doesn't it? Before Damon answers, Pat comes out with a stack of leaflets. Someone observes, there are 11 of us. We'll have to go in two cars. Pat gives half the leaflets to the six people who are to go in the other car. Louisa gives the other driver directions. On the way to the car, Damon continues talking to the woman from the office machine plant. 
and this seems to irk Louisa. When we reach the car, the woman gets into the front seat next to Damon. She looks slightly older than Louisa, although Louisa, in her girlish skirt, and with her hair hanging loose over her shoulders, looks much younger than her age. I slide into the back seat next to Pat. Louisa gets in next to him from the other side. Damon, apparently continuing his conversation with the woman, makes a comment that seems to be aimed at Pat. It's not to become a paper in which professional writers express themselves. They can confine themselves to their usual outlets. This paper is for workers who've never written before. Pat is about to respond to the comment, but Louisa prevents the resumption of the argument in the council office by resuming her own argument instead. She tells Pat, Maybe a leaflet can be printed without any type of organization, but I still think the new society is going to need an organization. Of course it has to be the workers' own organization. Pat responds angrily, In most people's mouths, organization and obedience are synonymous. Do you think this leaflet was printed without organization? My point was that organized activity is possible without order givers and order takers. Your new society sounds like a place where most people work and obey orders, while a few manage and make decisions. There's nothing new about that. Everything would be different if the workers themselves managed. Why? Pat asks. Louisa pauses and then answers, because present-day managers serve the interests of capital and the state, whereas workers would serve the interests of their fellow workers. That would transform the nature of all activity and all relations. The woman in the front seat turns toward Louisa. Get off it, dearie. Every union rep I know is a former worker, and every one of them serves the interests of capital and the state. They'll serve whoever pays their salaries, as they always have. Louisa objects. That's because these unions are all company unions. Oh, yeah? The woman asks. Well, I'm one of those who was around during the good old days when you got busted for talking union, and I know that the stories about union organizers serving the workers' interests are all bullshit. They were on the make then. That's why they seem so gutsy. Today they've made it. They've got no more reason to be gutsy. And what do you think they were on the make for? For workers' interests? Forget it. They were on the make for precisely what they've got today. Then you don't believe change is possible, Louisa concludes. Is that what I said, the woman asked? Why do you think I'm here, or in that commune? I think it's possible, but not with unions. I agree with the kid. If you've got managers, they're going to manage, no matter who or what they were before. Although Pat squirms when she refers to him as the kid, Damon swerves the car and almost sideswipes the car in the next lane when she expresses her next agreement with the kid. Damon just lost his newest recruit to the kid. The woman continues, unaware of the minor uproar she just caused. Some people think everything would change if all supervisors were women. That's the same baloney. I've got a woman supervisor. She used to be an ordinary worker. And let me tell you something, dearie. I wouldn't go out of my way to give her more power than she's got already. If you reject the very possibility of a genuine workers' organization, what are you left with, Louisa asks. The woman hesitates for a moment. Finally, she says, just people, I guess. That's what I hope to find out in the so-called commune. I thought I'd find people asking the same questions. She turns to Pat and asks, What do you think, kid? What's on the agenda after the unions, according to the younger generation? Pat stares at her but doesn't answer. He's obviously irked. I poke him gently and whisper, Tell us, Pat. I'd like to know, too. But Damon shouts, How would he know? Has he ever worked in a factory? That does it for Pat. He tightens his lips and stares out the window, a victim of ageism. I lower my hand to the seat and reach for my humiliated comrade's hand. His fist is clenched. I wrap my hand around it and try to formulate an appropriate answer to the woman's unintended insults. I can't speak for my whole generation. We kids are all different, you know. But I can tell you what at least one kid thinks. Pat smiles with gratitude and opens his hand into mine. I go on. I think the printing of this leaflet was a good example of what I'd consider free activity. It wasn't bossed by capitalists or union or party managers. The people most interested in it made all their own decisions and did their own work. They organize their activities themselves. Isn't that true, Louisa? Louisa hesitantly admits, That's true, but printing a leaflet is a simple matter compared to running a transportation system, provisioning a city with food. Louisa, I shout, Why can't you imagine those things being done any other way than they are done now? At this very moment, in this very city, all kinds of things are being done freely, no longer as wage labor, but as projects, exactly the way the leaflet was done. Complex things, too. I consider street theater an extremely complex art. The entire former university is organized by its present occupants. Some neighborhoods are starting to organize food distribution on their own. I could have shown you any number of pamphlets describing. Pat's enthusiasm suddenly returns. So does his pomposity. That's what I call the revolutionary project, the conscious domination of history by the men who make it. 
I let go of his hand abruptly. The men? You mean the kids? The rest of the trip to the assembly plant takes place in silence. Louisa directs Damon to park the car right across the street from the picket line and sound truck. Men wearing perfectly clean overalls walk in a circle carrying signs with the name of the union. This is a strike? Pat asks. It's not very exciting, but it is a strike, Louisa answers. Pat objects. But this is nothing but a ritual. Union bureaucrats are getting fresh air and being paid for it. Can we print those leaflets for them? Of course not, Louisa assures him. Pulling him out of the car, she says, Come on, I'll show you where the workers are. Damon gets out of the car and announces, I'll stick to the picket line. He hands the office machine worker a handful of the worker's voice and asks, You'll join me? She gives the copies back to Damon and asks Louisa, Where did you say they were? Damon walks quietly away from us and starts to give out his paper to the picketing workers and also to passers-by in a polite business-like manner. He seems to have brought about 50 copies, probably the day's ration. Louisa tells the rest of us, The main hangouts are the bar and the bowling alley next to it. There are also lots of people in the pinball machine parlor across the street. Basically, all the people here, except the bureaucrats, are waiting for something to happen. This is one of the dirtiest and most dangerous plants in the city, and people will be receptive to just about anything. I think the bar is the best place to start a conversation. I used to know that too, dearie, in the good old days. But shouldn't we wait for the others, the woman asks, referring to her six friends coming in the other car. Pat suggests, they probably got here first, saw what kind of strike it was, and didn't bother to stop. The woman agrees. You're probably right, kid. I mean, pal. People sure are thin-skinned nowadays. I'm for the bowling alley. I'll try the bar. How about you, Pat asks me. I hesitate for a second and then decide, I've never been to a bowling alley. The woman grabs half the leaflets as well as my arm. Never been bowling? Well, come on, honey. You don't know what you missed. Louisa glances across the street and waves to Damon. Then she shoves her arm through Pat's and shouts, Let's go raise hell in the bar. You knew, Louisa. I never did. I've never before seen the woman who made love to you during the work hours at the carton plant, nor the woman you saw leaving the carton plant with her arm through Mark Gladney's. She didn't let me see her. I used to be her conscience. She recently proclaimed her independence from her conscience. I shove my arm into the arm of the woman who calls me honey, and I shout, Let's go raise hell in the bowling alley. As soon as we go in, we notice a stack of the loudspeaker leaflets by the entrance. We also see them in people's hands. The six who came in the other car are bowling. The woman pulls me towards them. None of them believe me when I tell them I don't even know the point of the game. Apparently you're supposed to knock down wooden bottles at the end of a channel by rolling a large ball into them. The ball has holes in it and is held like a glove. I don't succeed in knocking down a single bottle. On my last try, the heavy ball-shaped glove refuses to leave my hand and I go flying down the alley with it. My comrades seem to enjoy that more than the game itself. Louisa and Pat enter the bowling alley. I ask them if they lost an argument. We didn't even have a chance to start one, Louisa said. She seems slightly tipsy. There's a ball game on, and everyone is watching the TV. We even went across the street, but one of you already gave leaflets out there. And it's impossible to hear anything above those machines. We should have titled the leaflet, Why Do You Allow Pinball Machines to Play for You? Pat says, at least Louisa and I had a stimulating conversation. A very stimulating conversation, Louisa adds. There's nothing like a few drinks to loosen tongues and soften tempers. Pat told me all about the real revolution. It's a festival where everyone does nothing but play. Not these capitalist pseudo-games, but living games. It's a gratification of all desires. A never-ending celebration. Do I have it right? Perfectly, Pat says, ogling her. Apparently he can't hold his alcohol as well as she can. How about all of us going to my house and having such a celebration, Louisa suggests. The woman turns down Louisa's invitation, so the three of us cross the street and find Damon trying to interest a union bureaucrat in the worker's voice. Louisa pulls him towards the car and invites him to her celebration. I'd love to come, but I've got some work I could do. Tugging at Damon's arm, Louisa hisses, only scabs work during a strike. Inside the car, she slips into the front seat and huddles next to him, begging, Please, Damon, we can discuss the next issue of the paper. There are numerous things I want to suggest. I slide into the back seat and wonder if Pat will get into the front seat next to Louisa, but he slips in next to me. The car starts. Pat's hand reaches for mine. I don't move away. His hand slips over mine and squeezes it. My heart pounds. A disorganized array of contradictory feelings surges through me. Contempt and resentment towards Matt combined with pity and with growing desire. The desire to outdo Louisa, the desire to undo your humiliation of me. If the revolution is a festival, then I warm up for it in the back seat of Damon's car. 
I get ready to celebrate, to gratify my own desires, to scandalize the union organizer, the professor, and the 18-year-old philosopher who considers men the only history makers. I pull my hand from under Pat's and place it over his, sliding my fingers slowly between his. The arrival of your letter couldn't have been time better. I've been longing to consummate this act, but I lack the justification, the courage, the setting. Your confession provides the perfect justification. Myrna's stubborn determination gives me a model of courage. Louisa's celebration promises to provide a perfect setting. No one talks on the way to Louisa's, but if anyone did, I wouldn't hear a sound. I'm deafened by the prospect of dethroning the Queen of Peasants, the prospect of shattering several porcelain statues. If revolution is the gratification of desires, then one of its fires is blazing in the back seat of Damon's car. I didn't understand the perverse character of my desire for Pat until I described it to you in my previous letter. If my desire was perverse then, it's even more so when I dig my fingers into the palm of his hand in Damon's car. I've lost almost all the admiration I initially felt towards him. The pure genius who had simultaneously attracted, intimidated, and repelled me is no longer such a genius, nor so pure to me. But if my desire is even more perverse than it was then, my moral self-restraint is gone now. It's been driven away by your letter, by your description of Louisa, by Louisa's insistent confirmation of every one of the traits you described. Still a prisoner of the restraints imposed by my eclectic morality after I sent you my previous letter, I stayed away from Pat for over a week. Twice I visited the occupied office machine plant a few blocks from the commune. I stayed away from the council office except on days when I knew Pat wouldn't be there. During that week I attended meetings of striking postal workers, newspaper printers, taxi drivers. The discussions in which I took part were the most stimulating discussions I've experienced. In a historical fraction of a second, people here have appropriated the entire history of revolution. Everything human beings in struggle ever reached for is being sought here and now. I ran into Pat in the council office, more or less by chance, a week ago. I described to him what I'd been doing. He described meetings he'd been attending. He spoke with contagious enthusiasm. It's fantastic. The entire so-called intellectual community is committing suicide, he exclaimed. In one after another session, the experts themselves are denouncing their own special fields as illegitimate, as cut off from the rest of social life. Philosophers, teachers, even medical students, though I haven't heard any doctors yet. I was fascinated and asked when the next such meeting would be held. Pat told me architects were to meet that night. His enthusiasm wasn't exaggerated. At that meeting, held in a large auditorium, one after another architect, not merely students, but practicing architects, described themselves as usurpers and their profession as an illegitimate monopoly over the individual's and the community's life activity, the creation of one's physical surroundings, the shaping of one's environment. At the end of the meeting, with an enthusiasm equaling Pat's, I nudged him and said, imagine the experts themselves denouncing their own expertise as a usurpation. Pat's response was, you really amaze me, Sophia. Very few people grasp the implications of what we just heard. My immediate reaction was to smile. I felt flattered. But then something like an electric shock went through me. I remembered his having said, you're really good, the day we had talked to several office machine workers in the restaurant across the street from their plant. He was impressed by the apparent presence of wit and intelligence comparable to his own in a person with breasts. And I was flattered. I swallowed my smile and tried to stare through him, but he was totally unconscious of his arrogance. During the next few days, he confirmed my new view of him. He demonstrated beyond a doubt that he's absolutely convinced he and his friends, all young men until Tina joined them as an equal, which I suppose means as a young man, have absolute monopoly over all human knowledge, wit, and insight. At the end of the architect's meeting, I limited myself to staring at him. We left our seats together and followed the crowd out of the auditorium. The hall outside was lined with literature tables. Every conceivable political sect was displaying all its wares to the intellectual community on the eve of its self-destruction. Behind one of the tables, I recognized a person I hadn't seen in ages. I ran towards her, shouting, Rhea Morphin! We embraced as if we had been best friends. Pat ran after me. I introduced Rhea as my roommate during my first year in college. Pat picked up one of the books on our table and asked, How much do they pay you to peddle this stuff? Only then did I glance at the publications on the table. Celebrations of state worship and glorification of the most tyrannical dictatorships in history. Rhea answered politely, No one pays me. I volunteer my time. With a sweeping glance at the table's contents, Pat asked, How about the political thought of Adolf Hitler? Is it sold out? What do you mean by that? Rhea asked, growing hostile. You've got the collected and selected work of all the other Fuhrers. How about... Rhea turned her back to Pat and asked me contemptuously, 
Is that the type of politics you're into now, Sophie? That's the type of politics I've always been into, Rhea. Have you forgotten we didn't part on the best of terms? Are you referring to your cliques excluding me from that underground paper? No, Rhea, I'm referring to your voting to evict me from the co-op. A customer who looked like a professor interrupted our conversation. He picked up two books, a compilation of the essential thoughts of a dictator, and a diatribe on petty bourgeois deviations in the workers' movement. Pat commented, Anticipation ends boredom for some. It creates fear in others. Are you talking to me? The customer asked. Pat picked up copies of the same two books, leafed through one, and said, We must see what the authorities say before we take any false steps. Do you have something against these books? The customer asked. I don't have anything against the books, Pat said. I'm just curious about the mentality of those who read them. The customer slammed his money down the table and walked away saying, These works are condensations of the historical experience of the international workers' movement. They're the ravings of megalomaniacs, Pat shouted after him. Rhea turned to me angrily. Would you mind taking your boyfriend somewhere else? Whispering, let's go, Pat. I wrapped my arm around my boyfriend, proudly displaying to Rhea not only my type of politics, but also my decadent immorality. It's ironic that I wanted to display the latter quality a week before I got your letter. But Rhea didn't let us get away. She shouted after us, Whenever workers regain consciousness and again turn to their organization, petty bourgeois intellectuals try to poison them with their philosophy of despair. I rush back to the table and hiss, The thought of your party's goons running the army and the police makes me despair all right. It sends shivers down my back. It gives me the creeps. Don't you know what they did to Lem? It turns out that Rhea did know. Her organization apparently had a whole line about what had happened to her one-time comrade. Don't tell me your lies about Lem, she shouted. I know your stepfather Alberts and his friends tortured him and then paid him to spy on and poison his former comrades. He turned Debbie Matthews into an alcoholic. Rhea started whispering because another customer was buying the condensed thoughts of another dictator. I decided to try my turn. May I ask why you're buying this book? I think we're living in a revolutionary period, she answered, and I want to learn what someone experienced in revolution had to say. It was fun to go on. You mean an expert on revolution? on how to fight your own battles and live your own life? Did you attend the meeting? Yes, and I agree with most of what was said. We architects have done nothing but serve the interests of the capitalist class, and that raises the question of legitimacy. How about the architects who serve the interests of the dictator whose work you just picked up? Is that service legitimate? I shouted. Rhea told the customer, She's being paid to heckle at my table. The woman paid for the book and walked away. I turned furiously at Rhea. All you're expert in is lying. The rule of your organization is the rule of liars, the reign of big lies. But the day of your glorious victories is gone. Everyone except a few idiots is onto you now. You're nothing but a carcass. Rhea smiled viciously. Don't cut us out too soon, Sophie. Half a century ago, everyone said we'd never win, and we won. Today, we've got nearly half the world on our side, and our power is still growing. We've sold more literature during the past week than during the previous ten years. Pat shouted, You're growing all right, like a cancer. All the life-destroying political sects are growing. You're not growing because you carry life, but because some people have been dead for so long they're afraid of life. You offer them death. That's why they turn to you. You rescue them from a void that calls for creativity and imagination, and you give them back their lost boredom and routine. You save them from the leap into the unknown and channel them back to the known. You're grave diggers of revolutions and murderers of revolutionaries. You're the cancer of our revolutionary period. Rhea's grin didn't leave her face. Do you think you'll ever get workers to follow your petty bourgeois philosophy of despair? I shouted, you can't even imagine people doing anything other than follow. Free human beings are inconceivable to you. Rhea still remained calm. Workers will be free when they become conscious of their need for their organization and their leaders. Said Hitler, Pat shouted. Who hired you to come here and heckle, Rhea asked me. I smiled and answered politely, no one hired us, Rhea. We volunteered our time. I took Pat's hand and we walked away from her. As soon as we were out of the building, I let go of Pat's hand. I was depressed. I recognized something of myself and Rhea. Not the commitment to the organization or to the state. The life-destroying function of the puppeteers and manipulators is perfectly clear to me now. Maybe it wasn't that clear to me 20 years ago. I was only 15. Your letters have made me extremely sensitive to the self-elective vanguards, the petty despots parading as the world's greatest rebels sucking blood out of beings who've just come to life, the organizers and politicians waiting to pounce on the slaves only just freed from masters. 
To all of them, the mere suggestion that human beings might be free and creative through their own efforts is an expression of despair. It's Rhea herself who is driven to despair. The possibility that people might do without her bureaucratic organization and its despotic central committee is what makes her despair. Just as the possibility that people might do without unions makes Louisa despair. What are we left with? Thanking Pat for telling me about the architect's meeting, I ran off to my bed in the dormitory. I was depressed by Rhea's lifelong dependence on authority to guide her life's activity because I recognized a smaller dependence in myself. Only instead of taking a ruler, a megalomaniac to borrow Pat's word, as my life's guide, I took Natalo, Louisa, you. I was wrong some time ago when I wrote you that my activity on the university's newspaper staff had nothing in common with Rhea's. If her articles reflected not her own practice and thought, but her authorities, so did mine. Whatever I wrote, I kept my community and my models in front of me as my guides. If Rhea didn't communicate thoughts but merely transmitted them, I did no more. I transmitted Louise's thoughts and what I took to be your thoughts. I didn't leave any more room for the mutual invention of projects than Rhea did. Only my authorities weren't among the world's great rulers, and therefore my dependence wasn't noticed, even by me. I remained depressed for two or three days, although I continued to be stimulated by the activities and unending debates taking place around me. I couldn't get Rhea out of my mind, nor Pat, and I again avoided contact with him. It was Tina who knocked me out of my sour mood. One morning she woke me at sunrise and literally pulled me out of bed. Nothing here could possibly be more exciting than the place I left last night, and I'd feel like a criminal if I didn't push you to go there, Tina told me. Last night I returned from the Occupied Research Center. Sabina and Tissy are both part of the new crew, and they're just dying to show the place off to you. Ted is going back there today, and he'll be glad to take you along. I hadn't seen Ted since I'd left the garage. I'd even avoided going to the print shop the day I came to the commune. My first response to the prospect of seeing him again was fright. Ted's nightly visits to Tina's room, my desperately violent attempt to pull him out of my bed, his conviction that I had intended to ravage Tina all flashed through my mind. I told Tina, I'd love to go. I'd love to go, but couldn't I go whenever you go back there? I just spent a week there. It was fabulous and I intend to go back, but I want to help clean up some of the mess in the print shop and I'd like to learn to use some of the things people brought. I know what you're thinking, Sophia. Before you ever left the garage, Ted figured out he'd been wrong about you. You were just as wrong about Ted. He's willing to forget. Why aren't you? Why are you so unfair? Is that why you woke me, Tina? To, to convince me to make up a Ted? Gosh, Sophia, you're just like a baby. No, I'm not trying to force you into anything. I genuinely thought you'd want to see that place and to see what Sabina is doing. Tina started to walk away from me. Wait, I shouted. I'll go if Pat agrees to go with me. In less than half an hour, Tina returned to my dorm room with Pat. If Tina thinks no one should miss it, then it must really be worth visiting, Pat said to me. And on the way there, I'll be able to ask the printer about some problems I've been having with the camera.